you all for coming. Okay, so before we get started, I want to do a quick experiment. Can I see a show of hands if you would consider yourself to be within the underrepresented category, either by reason of gender or race or ethnicity? Um, okay, we went over there. We've oh, interesting. So the majority of the audience is not preaching to the choir for a change. That's very exciting. Okay, I'm going to call that a step in the right direction. Um, it does feel like we are in a slightly new era of what has been a very long uh, extended discussion in this industry, one that's marked by action, sort of policies, programs, and less by waffly talk about good intentions. So in the spirit of that, I would love if you guys could introduce yourself briefly, but in the context of what have you been working on, what have you been attached to uh, that has moved the needle on diversity and inclusion um, in the last year, in the last two years? Rachel, I get please. Started? I get to go first, lucky me. So hi, everyone. I'm Rachel Palmer. I head VC and startup partnerships across the Europe, Middle East, and Africa for Google. So that means I work with the top VCs, such as Atomico, to utilize Google in the best way possible. I also look at um, very specific initiatives and really think about what does the ecosystem need and how can we change it? What can we do? And I think uh, we can all agree last year was a bit rough. Overall, we had COVID, we had a bunch of different things uh, happening. We had a lot of racial equity stuff pop up. Um, at Google, we believe that if we want technology to work for everyone, it has to be built by everyone. And right now, that just isn't happening. I think we uh, could clearly see that uh, in the numbers that were produced uh, last year, the shocking numbers. Um, across Europe, less than 0.5% of VC funding goes to black founders, which is a little nuts. Um, only 38 black founders were funded in the UK over the last 10 years, which is crazy. Um, and so we wanted to do something about that. And so we thought of a three-prong three strategy as we, we thought about, well, what can Google do to really help? And so the first thing is we need data, right? You cannot change anything if you don't have data. And so we launched last year the Black Report, which was the first report in Europe that looked at the black founder population. We also did something. So we pulled together a $2 million black founders fund. It's non-equity, equity-free cash. Um, and we distributed it to 30 startups across Europe. We also uh, gave up to $220,000 in ad and cloud credit and the support of Google behind each founder. After that, we also got another 3 million and we did the same in Africa for 50 startups. Um, the final part is, look, change can't happen alone. Yeah. So we worked very closely, are working very closely with partners, VC partners, such as Atomico and others that I won't announce yet, but we'll, we'll, you'll hear from us soon, to really work together to change what we see. And we definitely get it takes time and commitment. So that's what we're doing where we are. Those sound tangible, as people say, if you want to help, what is it? Make the hire, send the wire. And that yes. sounds like cash in hands, which is... What we want to what we want to see coming? Do you want to do you want to top that hero? How is Atomico showing up? Yeah, um, I'm hero. I'm a partner at Atomico. Um, I work on investments in both consumer and and on the software side. And I've been doing this now for quite a long time. It feels like 25 years of you know working with entrepreneurs of very diverse origin. I've you know had the privilege of you know investing and working with entrepreneurs from Asia, for, from Latin America, from Europe and the US, um, varying degrees of race and religion. So it's, it's something that is very near and dear to my heart, but equally, I think as Atomico, we've tried to be you know, a, a thought leader as far as, as best we can in Europe through tangible action. And so there's a few things that we've done within the kind of diversity, inclusion, equality, mm -hmm. uh, that I think, you know, are, are things that matter to us sincerely, you know, from one is an aspect on the investment side, the, the, you know, having targets in terms of what we would like to achieve in, in terms of D&I related targets in our portfolio companies, actually having measurements of what they're doing yeah. on an annual basis is something we track very seriously and we also share that with our investors so that it passes through and and people understand how important it is and I can come back to the fact that you know it's not just because it feels like it feels good 
I think it's actually a competitive advantage when you think about you know diversity and inclusion. It, it's about attracting that talent that, that has different perspectives that are going to make you more competitive. Um, we also have two other things that we do tangibly, and there's maybe there's three actually. One is also ourselves and our team. What does that look like in numbers? We've kind of gone from an era of majority male, you know, minority female to now, you know, that was probably like 65% to 35%. Now we're, you know, at 54 and, and you know, 40. Yeah, I heard you crossed that 45% Yeah, so 45%. Milestone. Those are all very important. And these are, this is the whole organization, but also the investment side. Mm -hmm. um, and that I think, you know, of, of the partners, of the f five partners we have, two are female. It's, there's a lot of good stuff that I think we're seeing. But we're holding, the point is we're holding ourselves accountable to, to this. I think the other two things that I think are having really good impact is one is through our angel program. So enabling our angel network to invest in both, you know, ethnically and gender diverse founders, we're getting really good statistics. It's like the pass through rate is like 65% of those that are getting funded through that program are gender or ethnically diverse. I mean, that's great, but it's only the beginning. Yeah. There's also the, the last part, which I'll say is, you know, what we call our fund of funds program where, you know, they're first time general partners that are launching funds, a lot of them you know, that we've done over the last five years, let's call it 12, of that 63% or so are either female mixed founders yeah. of these funds and or ethnically diverse. Okay, so we're seeing that in terms of who you're hiring, in terms of who you're investing in, and in terms of the future investors of the ecosystem, um, you guys are seeding change. Gun to head, where do you, where do you put Atomico relative to other sort of major or mainstream funds? Like, are, you, are they doing more? Are they doing less? Are they matching you guys? <laughs> it's hard to compare what, you know, I... I think you can measure that in some meaningful way. I think there's different industries that have existed, you know, prior to venture capitals, you know, blossoming that have more structured approach to to some of this and ESG inclusive DNI. Um, I think in VC it's still kind of a lot of headroom for all of us. So it's I don't know that we're, you know, we're doing our part as best as we can, but again, I think the important part is there's a lot more to do. Okay, um, Uber's not going to throw mud, so I will say that you're doing significantly more than most other funds. But what is interesting, though, is in what a difference it makes when there's a different mindset internal in an organization. Suddenly, exponential change becomes within reach. So I think it's interesting to try and unpack that a little bit. What are some of these mindsets that are still holding people back at a point when there's so many options like in front of uh, investors as to what to do? What are some of the ways people still think about diversity that are still, I don't know, acting as impediments to them pushing things forward? I think you had a slightly, <laughs> a slightly hilarious, if depressing, anecdote that, that came up um, backstage. And I'd, I'd, I'd love if you, could, if you could share, if it could shed light. Sure. So when it happened, I was, I was literally thinking, oh, I probably shouldn't be sharing this broadly. But now I, I share it with the world because I think the world needs to hear it. So COVID was an interesting time. It allowed us to gain access to rooms we usually don't get access to anonymously at times. And that happened to me in 2020. I was able to get into this posh conference with all these top, top VCs, um, but it was virtual because no one was meeting anyone at the time. And so I was in a session and George Floyd had just died. Black Lives Matter was happening. It was, it was a very... Uh, crazy kind of time with a lot of focus on racial equity. And one of the topics was about investing in diverse founders. My camera was off. I was probably being a bad employee. I was tapping away, had one ear in, one ear out. And I didn't up upload my pictures and all they could see was RP is here. And it was a room full of majority men. There were about two other women in there. And one of the VCs piped up and he said, when talking about investing in diverse founders, he said, well, my LP told me that my job is returns and to leave the charity 
to him. I was like, whoa, <laughs> that's, that's crazy. So I quickly tuned in with both ears and I turned on my camera and I asked him, I said, well, for your next round of funding, are you, are you going to take his money? And the answer was yes. And so I think the, the real core of that is the sentiment, and I started to talk to other friends that were in VC and all that, the, the sentiment was that investing in diverse founders is not a returns gig, it's a charity gig. And that's how people, a lot of people, and I'm not saying all, but a lot of people are, are seeing it. And I think it, it served as kind of the, the thinking of the strategy behind our Black Founders Fund. So obviously when we got this cash and we're trying to figure out how to distribute it, we, there was conversations, there was a lot of press. Black people are struggling, our businesses are dying, we're just, just so destitute. And people were like, well, we need to give this to people that need it. And I was like, no, I remember that conversation. We need to give it to the absolute best black founders out there. And that is exactly what we did. We're not saving anyone. We're not doing anything like that. We are funding the best black founders. And the whole point is to prove to the industry that there are returns in this community. And I can talk about the impact when you're ready, but we, we, we definitely have some. You're grinning That's from year to year, so I think you kind of want to share. So what are some of the impacts? We'll keep going. It's a pretty nascent program. So yeah, I would love to hear some of the things that you guys are proud of. So, sure. So our two million that went in um, today, in less than five months, the cohort of 30 has raised 55 million in follow-on funding. So that's a 27x follow-on, which is fantastic. Um, we've seen an uptick, 21% increase in the number of employees across the cohort. Uh, we are seeing breakthrough startups right now, which uh, are building those proof points for the industry to show that there are diverse founders that can make it. So we've got Definely, which will be raising their Series A soon. They have um, 15 x their early investors' money, mm -hmm. which I think is a pretty good return. And we also have Audio Mob, which did their very successful Series A, uh, and they have 10x, more than 10x, their early investors' money in less than a year. And I'm going to point them out over there, right there, raise your hand, <laughs> because, and all of you do not swarm them, Christian and Wilford, but when they're ready to raise, they're right there. This is the new face of successful black founders. Right there. Excellent. Raise your hands and let everyone see you. I, listening. What are some of the highlights on your end? Because I think we talk so much about how far we have to go, and I think we don't talk anywhere a, near enough about a, how we was, know it is changing. Um, I had a recent conversation with Carl Loco from Black Sea. There's a friend of mine. He had a very distinct point, which is you know something that kind of I thought about while you were speaking, Rachel. It's with the amount of capital that's available to the universe of entrepreneurs, it is shambolic. The amount of in this conversation we're talking about, you know, the amount of capital available for black founders, and um, you know, he had a very distinct point that cut through a, a lot of the noise, which was capital, mm -hmm. need capital. To provide capital is a very distinct solution that over time will play out. And it was, it, it was a very refreshing one because there could have been a lot of different fluff in that conversation about, you know, and, and he's not saying that, you know, the contributions that people are trying to make on the peripheral periphery of support. Yeah, but you can, you can only mentor someone so far. Exactly, if they can't exactly. pay for office and, and space, if they can't hire, this, then it doesn't matter. This was a this was an incredibly, yeah. you know, like poignant conversation that I had recently, and and it and so it only kind of heightened the awareness for myself, which I share with you know the people in my organization, like. We need to we need to help trigger that more, and this is why like I, I I feel like with all the things we can do to support it, that's the thing that we need to really try to prioritize, and I think it will happen over time. This isn't like an overnight success story. The feel good factor, just because you know Black Lives Matter or whatever the movement might be, is a moment in time. But I think consistency is probably like. A, a core element that should stick in people's mind when they're thinking about like taking this seriously. 
And so, you know, if I were to bring it back to how we continue to, to remind ourselves as an organization, you know, I think one of the first things we did, which uh, quite frankly, I was also like quite, I had, you know, a decent amount of anxiety is make public all our goals in terms of ESG, d &I, and share that in an open source way. And this is really comes from Nicholas's thought process of being open about a lot of it. He is a true believer that this will set us free and it will also create commercial value, which has worked for you know those of us that participated in Skype all the way to Atomico. Mm -hmm. It is kind of how we roll. Yeah. And that is what we're doing to remind ourselves every year and saying, where did we come short? Because most of the time, <laughs> we are, yeah. right? And this is why I'm saying there's a lot of headroom, and, and which is why like, it has less to do with what the market is doing and competitors are doing or other colleagues are doing and other firms. It's like just saying, okay, does this make sense? And yeah. getting feedback from you guys and, you know, and saying, hey, is this like, do you think this is a good level setting of what we're trying to do? Those are the things that matter. 100%. So we know that capital makes a meaningful difference. We know that a starting point when you're thinking about how to move the needle should be what, like, where can we get capital and how can we redirect it into the founders that need help? What do we want to see less of? What do we know isn't really working anymore? What's still kicking around? Is there anything that you've come across that you're a little bit tired of or you want to see <laughs> set aside? If there isn't, that's also fine. Maybe it's a good sign that we've cut the fluff already. Um, but if we really think we're hitting that point of sort of exponential change, then it, we imagine then that we've nailed it on strategy, at least, even if we still have a ways to go in execution. So what are my annoyances? Is that what you're asking? All right, I got you. Um, so I hate, I hate the, the comment by VCs, because I, I do hear it a lot, around it being a pipeline problem. Mm. It is not a pipeline problem. You know what? We, we put out two million into the ecosystem, and we had 800, almost 800 applications <laughs> across uh, 16 countries. And in Africa, we had almost 3,000 applications across 36 countries for 3 million in funding. Funny thing happens when you put out money for people that generally don't have access to it, they come. Yeah. So, pipeline problem? No, I, I don't like hearing that. And anyone that does decide to tell me that, I invite you to come read applications with me because it was a lot to get through. A problem at some point. There was something <laughs> interesting somebody said where if you, you know, you take an island, you split in two, and then you do everything you can systematically to make the, the gap between yeah. where you are and where individuals are as wide as possible. And then you don't build any bridges. You don't put any of the work to bring that land back together. And you're like, yoo -hoo, you can come over here if you want some funding. And you're like, but they just don't want to come. And you're like, what about this massive void yeah. between where you are and where they are that you've instrumentally done? So I think some of those like step-to-step -step things are really critical. What are some of the things that you guys did that meant that you were exposed to the founders who needed to hear about the program, that they were encouraged to? What are some of the things that you did that meant that you saw those 800 applicants where some people say, well, we tried to hire a female associate, we tried to hire, or we tried to invest in uh, black founders and we didn't find them? Sure. So I think um, one of the things that we did, a couple of the things we did was we made sure that we tapped into black networks. So there are definitely community players that have a voice in the ecosystem. There are groups of black people that convene, and we made sure the message went out. I, I definitely, you know, heard about other programs that had launched previously where, you know, from the black community, well, we didn't know about that. Like, how do we, how, you know, how are we supposed to apply? <laughs> like, like, so I made sure that as we um, decided to launch this fund, myself and Marta Krupinska, so my co-lead on this, amazing co-lead for this, um, I made sure that when we did this, that we made sure that we tapped those ecosystem players to really get the word out about the funding. Um, um, in terms of other annoyances, I have another one when you're ready, but we can stay on this topic if you'd like. Let me know when you're ready. Okay, go on. I'll take another gripe. Okay. I'm well, curious if you have any too. The, the other thing that um, kind of gets to me when, when we launched this fund, and even before, you know, a lot of others came to us and, hey, we want to work with you, we want to help and all that. Black people in general, we are over-mentored and underfunded. When I look at our founders, they are struggling to figure out which program do I apply to? Like, th there's a lot there. And we really need value add. So, under men uh, over mentored, underfunded in the startup e ecosystem, in corporates, we're over mentored and under sponsored. It's the same yeah. struggle. And so, I would say, like, 
if you want to help, bring real value. I learned a lot from some of our startups when talking about raising. I, re I particularly remember one conversation when they were like, a VC, another investor came. This was you know, a startup that was getting attention. And they came and they said, what, what can you offer is what they asked them. Oh, strategic advice. Well, you know, <laughs> we get a lot of that nowadays. <laughs> Google so, exists. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> yes. Real value is what they're looking for. So if you yeah. want to, you know, help in this cause, funding if you have the cash, and other things if you have a service yeah. that you can offer, offer it. Here, I'll give you the option. Are there any gripes? But if not, also, is there anything missing in, in terms of our, 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 strategic, our strategic toolkit? Is there anything we aren't doing yet, something you want to see more of, uh, whether from Atomico or from the broader ecosystem or even from other stakeholders that would move the needle meaningfully? I mean, there's a lot of things that are probably, you know, worthy of annoyance. Um, <laughs> I could think of quite a few. I'll take But one. maybe one angle to think about it is, for me, my biggest annoyance is sometimes myself, mm. which is, you know, there's, I, I come from a far away place too, but, you know, I can call Europe at least my home after a dec decade plus of, of being here and, and also working with a huge variety of diverse founders, even in Europe. So, you know, I have a lot of, and, and it's, it's also a place where it's accepted me on, on you know, varying levels of, of, you know, being a part of the ecosystem. So I, I, I feel like there's a lot of potential. Um, but the annoyance is, again, back to myself, which is, I feel like there's a lot more I could potentially do but you know, and and you know, I think we we do make a genuine effort, both personally and as an organization. But you know, the loss, getting lost in the tidal wave of the things that you have to do every day, is the one thing that I always get annoyed with. And then there are moments that you come back to these discussions, and you're like, yeah. man. I'm not doing I'm, it. I'm, this means something to me yeah. because I'm also a party to it. But yet, you know, there's, it, it doesn't happen as consistently. So it really does annoy me that I'm not, you know, it, and it's, it's, it's inevitable on some level, you know, and I'm not making an excuse, but I think there's, there's a no, lot. Absolutely. I think you know, it's always really interesting because by default, your bandwidth as, a, as an investor is, is, is zero, right? You're already doing more than you have room for. Few funds are operationally set up such that people actually have headspace for innovation in any sense or deep thinking in a broader sense or even the learning on new themes, let alone the active work of restructuring the society around them. Um, but what are, like, you know, clearly if we say that, I'm willing to say it if you're not that Atomico has gone a little bit further in terms of how it's been able to innovate and, and, and implement change in this space, clearly as an organization you're doing a better job of creating that headroom, creating that space for people to bring their whole selves to work so they can do that work. What has been, what has made the difference there? I think, I think what do you want to do more of? Maybe that's what you're committing to. I think that, I think it goes back to maybe the point that, you know, also, you know, when, when we were up here with Infarm, we we're talking about that same thing and a lot of different portfolio companies find competitive advantage in diversity and diversity on a broad range of the definition. But I, I'd say that for us, when I think about it today versus maybe five years ago, I feel like it's the opportunity, right? There is a huge arbitrage opportunity that will emerge because of the efforts of you guys, because of the efforts of other groups that are trying to sponsor entrepreneurship over the next five years, this seed will then create a moment yeah. where there will be a lot of upside. So if you start thinking about it, even in that very maybe crass commercial you know, perspective, 100%. that's the point though, right? The point is it's not a charity. It's not, this is an opportunity set that will emerge. And if you start thinking about it that way, mm -hmm. I feel like you have a different kind of way of thinking yeah, about it. because you make different decisions in terms of the investment you put. Exactly. If you're like quantum is the future, but you have no specialist within your fund whose job it is to make sure that everybody's exactly. educating themselves, everybody's putting in time for the workshops, then nothing changes. Um, um, and I think but, that's... But, I, you know, it just came to mind because the other part of the annoyance component has something to do with maybe a success factor yeah. in, if you turn it around, is, you know, I think in the whole organization, 
if you can infect yourself in that way of like kind of productivity and opportunity rather than obligation, I think it starts to change like how people approach it. And it's not just one person who's like some DNI responsible person that has to run around and like champion the cause and you know get on stage and talk about it because it makes everyone feel good for a few minutes. It changes everything because a lot more people in an organization engage to say, oh wow, this could actually be, you know, yeah. you know, dare I say it, profitable. Right? And this is the thing that really is like nice when you can get more people to, to, to kind of like move in that direction. And I think that's the one thing, it's an annoyance, but it's also maybe a little bit of an unlock to do more is if you can get, don't put one person in charge, get more people involved, but also change the narrative. Yeah, how do you make it everybody's business? Not just Absolutely. the the business of the person who has the most skin in the game, pardon the pun. I will add, you know, just so that everyone's aware, my job is not a diversity role. I <laughs> I have a commercial exactly. role. Exactly. But when I look at the ecosystem, part of what needs to happen in Europe is that we need to transform. We need to capture these opportunities. I have, you know. I guess it's the benefit of being American. I've seen they're, they're probably a little bit more ahead in terms of the diversity conversation. And I can see what's happened there and I can see where we're at. So everyone out there, be aware, my role is not a diversity role. <laughs> It's, this is the commercial thing. But this is part know, of the problem, right? Yeah. This, you know, you wear, you wear two hats yeah. all the time because you're not able to switch off the party view that is aware of the discrepancy in the room of who isn't there and yeah. who doesn't have a seat at the table. You don't really have the luxury of putting it down at any point, and so you end up, as a result, doing that role. So I think it's incumbent on organizations to say this burden exists one way or another. Can we spread it around? And actually, as you say, flip it from a burden instead. This is an opportunity, and we are just not where we need to be on it. Nobody thinks it's okay okay to have no idea about a new technology phenomenon exactly. as an investor. Everybody thinks it's okay to say, well, I just don't have time to study. Yeah, you do. Figure it out. <laughs> exactly. <That's laughs> exactly. Right. Um, I think something that's always really, really great to end on when we have these conversations um, is to think specifically about some sort of endpoint so that we don't constantly think that we're in this Sisyphean endless when do you think we don't have this conversation anymore? When don't we have this panel? When do you think parity is either already achieved or is so close to non-entity anymore? Like, is it, is it two years? Is it 100? Is it 50? Like, a sense of that proportion, I think, can really make the difference in terms of, like are, like, are we on track? Like, I think something changed significantly in the climate discussion when we went from, when is it better, to, <laughs> in 2030, this is what would happen. In 2050, this is what would happen. And suddenly, we were thinking differently about whether we were close or far away. But when do I no longer have to do this panel again? So I'm going to say, I mean, I hope this isn't disappointing, but I think change will take time. I think, um, you know, when we, wow, somebody's having a good time over there. Um, <laughs> I, I think, uh, I definitely think change will take time. I mean, when we think of the whole idea of, if we look at the pure incentives of many funds, and, and this is fair, right? Even an LP, I was asked to be an LP. I was like, hey, number. where is my money? You know, all around. Returns, have right? Have when we start to think about that and really proving returns, when people are trying to select who to invest in, People naturally, the human naturally decides, like, they use signals, they cheat, right? What school do they go to? Do they look like me? Do they, all that sort of stuff, right? And so I think we need to build great proof points, and that takes time. Build the audio mobs of the world, or the define leads of the world, or, and build more of time? those. Huh? How much time? Okay. I'm going to put in my calendar and call you that day, and either we celebrate or yes. we throw exactly. something at the wall. So we need to build those, and that takes time. And then I think, I guess, if you think about pure metrics, when do we meet parity? I, I would say I would love to see the funding distribution match the population distribution, because right now it's quite far off. <laughs> do you want to take a stab when you... Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, if we could do what we might suspect takes mm -hmm. 10 years to do in five... Okay, that'd be great. You know, I think this is not a microwavable, you know, problem. It's not... Something no. that you put in and it comes out all good, all quickly. I, I think it takes time, but you know, I think that the reality is these. It's it's like business building, right? Mm -hmm. In three, if if five is three, that's great. But I think we need to see progress in a time frame of you know three to five years. Okay. I don't know if we're not going to be like sitting here, <laughs> but at least yeah. there is something 
to think about in terms of what does the world look like in three years, in five years. That, to me, is, is something that, is, that I'm deeply interested in. I like that. That's relatively hopeful. We've been about 10 years in the inception phase of it, and we're hoping for three I hear five. you. As a show, what do we think? Three to five years as a show of hands? Do we say yes, no, it'll take longer, it'll take less time? I would, I would like to leave on a hopeful note. Who says three to five years is when we will reach parity? Hands up. Wow, this is an incredibly... I think, I think, I think we can... Incredibly <laughs> pessimistic group of people, but uh, fair enough. I think we can accelerate that, though, okay. with the help of all of you. So I think, look, we have... Ama in, our, in our cohort, we have amazing black founders. Help fund them, if you can. Help support them. There are plenty of diversity programs that have identified great founders. Support them. If we do go. it together, we can get there a lot faster. Excellent. That's what I think. Let's say it's happening in three years. If it's not in three years, I will find each and every one of you, and you can explain to me why you haven't done it. Enough. <laughs> we'll be, Thank we'll you be so much for your attention. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you.